Hello, my name is Dr. Derek Olson. I have a PhD in New Testament and my focus of my research is on the history of biblical interpretation. So we're going to be talking about the pre-modern period. So right after the writing of the New Testament and moving up towards the modern day. This is the first of two videos on this uh, for St. Mary's Seminary. First, we have to look at the trends in the interpretive context. How are people at this time and place reading scripture? And, and by this time and place, we're talking uh, within the Roman Empire in the first century. In the Greco-Roman world, we see that philosophy is a part of daily life and was integrated into religious understanding. So with Alexander the Great's Hellenization of uh, the, the world in the Mediterranean basin, Greek philosophy had spread throughout and was a common language for talking about things moral, spiritual, and philosophical. Classical texts referencing the official state pantheon, like Homer and Hesiod, uh, were increasingly being read with philosophical tools. So philosophers would read the Odyssey and the Iliad by Homer and look at the stories of the gods that they told there and say, the things that they're relating here are not truly worthy of the gods. There must be a deeper meaning. Uh, so more specifically, uh, can this story be read in a way so as to uh, teach us something about nature or teach us something about truth? And so philosophical tools then were used to read the scriptures that they had inherited. Same thing was true of the mystery religions. Uh, the mystery religions in the Roman Empire largely came from the East, uh, areas that had been Hellenized for a very long time. And so Greek philosophy was already bound up in how these religious systems functioned. Allegorical readings were expected here. In fact, one of the charges against Christianity by uh, Greco-Roman authors was that its scriptures weren't complicated enough to actually be allegorized. So several church fathers had to actually argue against that. The way that Jewish people were reading scripture in the late Second Temple period, which is where we are, uh, late tech Second Temple is going to go up to 70 AD when the temple is destroyed. Uh, scholars like Aristobulus and Philo, operating out of Alexandria, were doing what their neighbors were doing, and they were applying readings drawn from Platonist uh, tools to the Jewish scriptures. Uh, so heavy allegorization of the things that they read in creation, uh, in the giving of the law, in the construction of the tabernacle, that kind of thing. The text from Qumran, the Dead Sea Scrolls, also show community-focused reading strategies. So in particular, what we see are things like the Pesherim. Uh, and in the Pesher, you'll see uh, a psalm being read in relation to what's going on with the leader of the community. And so scripture is being read with specific reference to what's going on with our people at this time. When Christians then uh, developed their own methods of reading the scriptures, these tools were brought together. And at the heart of Christian reading is that Christ is the key to the scriptures. So early Christian interpretation is centered around Christ as the heart and central meaning of the scriptures. The New Testament itself is going to preserve this perspective. In the earliest writings that we have, so the writings of St. Paul, Paul reads the Old Testament Christologically. And he says, and the rock was Christ. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 10, 4, uh, talking about the Israelites fleeing Egypt uh, and going to the Promised Land, his interpretation there is, is very Christological. He also reads typologically. So when he talks about Sarah and Hagar in Galatians 4, he goes through that text to show that uh, Sarah and Isaac, the child of the promise, are actually connected to the church, whereas Hagar and her children are connected uh, to Jewish believers. Uh, Q, which underlays Matthew and Luke, uses Psalm 91 as the center of the temptation narrative. Uh, and in doing so, reads, puts Christ at the center of an interpretive crux. The apostolic preaching in Acts places psalms in the mouth of Christ uh, and interprets them specifically with reference to him. The normative context for interpreting the scriptures is going to be the liturgical gathering of the community. So real Christian reading happens when Christians gather together to worship, to pray, uh, to share the sacraments, because that's who the Christian community is at its most normative point. And as a result, uh, the Christian reading of the scriptures is centered within the liturgical practice. One of the outgrowths of this is that a literal interpretation of the scriptures is not sufficient. If Christ is the center, then experiences of Christ and of the church, which is his body, become the normative lens for reading scripture. Psalm 91, in fact, illustrates this particular problem. 
the literal meaning of Psalm 91 is that God is going to preserve his faithful from all harm. Uh, if a faithful person is, is hurt or injured, uh, how, do we, how do we read that text? Is it because they weren't good enough? They weren't faithful enough? Christ, however, dies on the cross. And church teaching tells us that all of the faithful apostles, with the exception of John, died as martyrs. John, the exception, died in exile. So what this means is that Psalm 91 requires a spiritual reinterpretation. And the way that we have gotten used to reading that psalm is that God will preserve the souls of the faithful, not necessarily their physical lives. We're so used to this that uh, preserving the souls of the faithful is almost our default literal interpretation. But that's not what the words on the page say. We need to stop and recognize that's not actually a literal reading of this text. It's a spiritualization of the text. This becomes increasingly important because martyrdom was understood as the primary means of the imitation of Christ in the opening Christian centuries. Uh, we can see this most vividly in Acts 7, where the stoning of Stephen very closely parallels Christ's own death, especially as we read it in the Gospel of Luke. So Luke is, is telling us the martyrdom of Stephen through the lens of his story of the crucifixion of Christ. All right, Origen of Alexandria, who died in 253, was one of the greatest minds of the Christian church. Uh, he really established biblical reading for the early church, and to do so, he used an anthropological model of the text. Uh, he talks about the scriptures having a body, uh, and this is the literal or historical meaning of the text, what, what the words on the page actually mean. And he talks about the soul of the text. This is the moral meaning of the text. And then he talks about the spirit. This is the spiritual meaning of the text. Uh, and by spiritual, what he means is the meaning that reveals the person of God and God's mysteries to the believer. So this is something that can only be grasped by someone who is a faithful Christian. It can only be grasped as it is revealed by the Holy Spirit. All scripture being inspired by God, all scripture will tell us something about the person of God or the mysteries of God if they're read in the correct way with the correct spirit. And so this then is the spiritual reading that Origen talks about. All scripture, he'll say, has a spiritual meaning, but not all of it has a literal meaning. And, and this can seem very strange to modern readers of the text, uh, especially those who have been trained to read the text historically. The reason he says this is because Origen was an extremely close and careful reader of the text. He knew about mistakes and contradictions in scripture. He points them out to his readers and says, these things are the reason why we can't just do a flat literal reading of the text. In fact, he's going to make the argument that there's a, a specific reason for the errors in the text. They point us to a spiritual meaning that we might potentially miss if the words there were literally true. Now, Origen, when he did this, he didn't see himself as doing something new. Instead, he very much referred back to how Paul had read the text uh, and sees himself continuing Paul's interpretive method. Later interpreters, then, are going to follow Origen uh, and use his basic framework, uh, but with some changes, with some um, clarifications, uh, with some additional moves. So, the key points for this first presentation about Christian reading are this. First, early Christians read their text the same way that Jewish and Greco-Roman readers of the period did. They weren't doing anything different, uh, new, or unusual. Philosophical and literary methods like typology, prosopology, uh, that's hearing a specific passage in the words uh, of someone, placing it in someone's mouth, uh, and allegory were common and expected. Jesus Christ, the Word of God, is the center and key to the scriptures. If you're reading the text and you've not seen Jesus in it, maybe you need to read it again. And so for these readers, scripture's truest meaning is either related to Christ in his person or to his body, which is the church. And finally, scripture informed and was informed by the sacramental gatherings of the church. We can't uh, look at the church's interpretation of the scripture apart from the church's practices, what it did, specifically what it did when it gathered together for, for worship and praise. 